Now turn please to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 for our Bible reading, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I welcome you to the Bible class, and it's good to see all who have gathered here today, and we trust the Lord will touch our hearts as we continue with our study on the Ten Commandments. And I want to read a portion here today that is very relevant because it uh, brings before us something of what the Lord would have us to know and understand concerning the Seventh Commandment. 1 Corinthians 6 and the verse number 12. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient, which means profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Meats for the belly, and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God hath both raised up the Lord, and will also raise up us by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ, and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body, for two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And we know the Lord will bless the reading of the Word to each of our hearts. <clears throat> I don't think I welcome you. I'll do that now. It's good to see you all here and our webcast viewers as well. And we pray the Lord will bless us today. Now, the latter part of this chapter... 1 Corinthians 6 reveals that the Lord's people need to be on constant guard against sins of immorality. It is very obvious from the flavor of this passage, and indeed other portions of this epistle, that in the Corinthian church there were deep moral problems. And therefore, among other reasons, Paul wrote this epistle to deal with this issue of sexual impurity. And in the light of what he writes, it's very obvious that the moral law, in terms of the seventh commandment, was actually the basis of his instruction in this passage. That is very obvious. It is true to say that in the wicked and degenerate times in which we live, the violation of the seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, is more prevalent than at other times. That is the day in which we live. Such is the gross immorality of this generation that it is apparent that society has broken asunder this divine command uh, to do with moral, uh, moral purity. Uh, society has cast aside, cast it away altogether. The flagrant breach of the seventh commandment is manifested in our times, especially by... I mean, in an outward way, by the debased language of our day with regard to moral issues. You see, God's Word actually teaches us how to talk about the physical aspects and the basic purposes of the marriage institution. The Word of God is very modest in how it speaks on these matters, very modest in its language as it addresses these issues. It is written in such a manner so as not to arouse evil passions. And we should pay heed to that. God's Word's written very carefully. And so when God addresses marriage, or even the physical relationship, that is, of course, part of marriage, a very large part of marriage, it uses terms that will never arouse the passions of the corrupt heart. We must understand that such is the, cor the corruption of the human heart, when it is confronted by God's law that prohibits sin, it is actually stirred to lust for the very things that are prohibited, that are forbidden by God. That is a fact. 
Paul mentions this when he says in Romans 7 verse 9, when the commandment came, sin revived. Now think about those words. When the commandment came, sin revived. What he means is that whenever he heard the law of God concerning various things or read the law of God concerning various matters, and the law of God prohibiting sin and forbidding sin, such was the evil of his heart that his heart actually rose up to lust for the very things that God forbids. Now I've used this illustration before, but I'll use it again. Uh, that is concerning what I'm just saying. An illustration is that, isn't it true that when you or I or anybody else maybe goes into a building and there's a sign on the door and it says, do not enter, what's your reaction? What's in there? I would like to know. And even you might try to force your way in. That illustrates the point that Paul's making. When the commandment comes, sin revives. That's not because there's something wrong with God's law. There's something wrong with our hearts. And so, when you find the Word of God dealing with moral issues, it couches the teaching and the language in very modest terms, so as to not give an occasion for the heart of man to lust or to desire those things that God's actually addressing. May I say that the version that really does this properly is the authorized version. If you go to modern versions that deal with or that uh, on, in places where this has been dealt with, these moral issues, you will find that they use modern jargon. And they use terms that are not modestly couched. And therefore, those very translations of the Word of God can be judged as to give license to some kind of lusting and desiring that God's actually forbidding in those places. That's why the authorized version is the best version in that sense as well, because it couches its language in that proper and modest fashion. But the language of our days has become so debased that it is very clear that the seventh commandment is under severe attack. It's broken openly, blatantly, flagrantly by a society that actually believes that it's right to break the seventh commandment, or the seventh commandment has no bearing in our day, or it's of no value and we just simply ignore it. That's the way society is, and that, as I say, is actually shown by the very language that people use as we are aware, fully aware. We hear it all the time around us, and it forces itself into our faces and so forth, and, and therefore the very language of men is the evidence that this commandment no longer holds any importance or any value within the thinking of multitudes. But in God's moral law, this commandment remains, Thou shalt not commit adultery. It's interesting that when the Lord Jesus Christ on one occasion was addressing that man, the rich young ruler, about uh, his question, what may I do to obtain eternal life? And the Lord took him to the law and began to quote the law, that the Lord Jesus Christ put the seventh commandment before the sixth commandment. That's in Mark 10 verse 19. And the Lord said to the young man, Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit a adultery, do not kill, do not steal, and all he goes. But notice that he puts the seventh commandment before the sixth commandment as he quotes from the second table of the law dealing with sins against our fellow men. And what the Lord is doing there is he shows that moral purity should be as dear to us as our very lives are. He puts the seventh commandment before the sixth commandment. He says, do not commit adultery. Then he says, do not kill. That's what he's saying. He's saying that moral purity should be as dear and precious to men as their very lives are. We should be as afraid of what defiles the body as what will destroy the body. That's what the Lord's showing. Paul's advice to Timothy is very relevant. Keep thyself pure. Keep thyself pure. And so the Word of God has not changed, folks, and this commandment still stands. Now, what I want us to look at today, as time allows us to do so, is that the marriage institution 
is preserved by this commandment. That's the basic thing that this commandment is teaching. It's a preservation of the marriage institution. Other sins of an immoral nature are condemned by this commandment. As I will see, show you by the help of the Lord, for we'll come back to this commandment again on another occasion. But the basic sin that's in view in the breach of the seventh commandment is the breach of marriage through the sin of adultery. So this commandment protects marriage. That's what it's doing, basically and essentially. It's designed to protect marriage. Thou shalt not commit adultery. And in the Bible, the word adultery basically has to do with sin that is, per, that is committed by someone within the marriage bond, either the husband or the wife. That's the basic sense of the word adultery, even the Hebrew or the Greek words for adultery. They have to do with sin in that particular realm, the breach of the marriage bond, the marriage vow and so on. So it's dealing with this, and therefore it does by implication, the seventh commandment, it protects the marriage institution. Now, marriage is a creation ordinance. As we think about marriage, we must think about that fact. It's a creation ordinance. In Genesis 2, 21 to 25, you've got the first marriage ever performed on this earth, and it was performed by God Himself. And by his own act, therefore, at creation, God instituted marriage. Man didn't institute it. God did. That's important. That's why man has no right to tamper with it or change it or whatever or do away with it. It's the ordinance of God. And everything in the Bible about marriage, you will find, uh, actually goes right back to Genesis 2. Whenever the Lord Jesus Christ taught on the subject of marriage, in Matthew 19, he refers to the beginning. He says, in the beginning it was not so, and so forth. And so the Lord takes us back to the beginning. He says, they twain shall be one flesh. And he's referring to Genesis 2. Or when Paul teaches on marriage, he takes us back to the beginning. Ephesians 5, verse 23, he refers to the husband and the wife and their possessions in the marriage, and he says the husband is the head of the wife. And in making that statement, he's showing that the teaching of the Christian church on marriage is based on the creation ordinance. And we must understand this. In fact, if you look at Genesis 2 another time, we'll not look at it, uh, turn to it now, but many of you know the verses. And you know the very last verse or so there in that passage, Genesis 2, 23, 24. And the Lord says, For this reason shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife. And what the Lord is showing there is, so close is the marriage union that the parent-child relationship gives way. Think about what I've just said. It's not that parents and children are completely severed when their sons take wives or their wives take husbands, but that the union that is then formed by their son or their daughter taking the spouse in marriage is of the closest kind. The union that's formed is of the closest kind. And therefore, the parent-child relationship gives way to... Uh, the new marriage is set up. And may I say that grandparents then need to give way, or the fathers and the mothers of, of those who have just got married, whatever stage they're at, uh, just got married, or especially when children come along, grandparents must not interfere in that marriage. And anyhow, say no more. That doesn't come to today really, but it's a very important matter in itself. The English word marry, just taking our English word, marry, comes from a Latin root verb that means to take a husband. That's the meaning of the word marry, to take a husband. And it has to do, therefore, with the union that's formed in marriage. And so in entering into marriage, the woman takes her husband, and the man becomes her husband, and the two become one. So the basic sense of the word marry is actually that of union. 
Now, when you think about this, that the word marry means to take a husband, it signifies union. When you think about that, you will find the word marry been used in other fields, other areas. For example, in the field of literature, we talk about marrying our thoughts, thoughts coming together. We use the word marry sometimes in talking about the converging of thoughts and the, and the union of, of thoughts in our minds. They marry, they come together. Or in the field of horticulture, uh, if you maybe are interested in that, you will know that when the horticulturalist uh, is attending to his plants or his uh, trees and so on, what he may do is he may marry a slip into another tree. He takes a, a slip or a cutting and he ties it on whatever way he does it, I have no idea, and he gets it uh, up against the trunk or the branch of another tree and he marries the two. The very word is used in that realm of horticulture because it signifies union. So, here is what we mean by marriage. Here's what the Bible means by marriage. It is indeed a, a creation ordinance, and it signifies very clearly the idea of union. It's a covenant ordinance. Look at Malachi chapter 2 and verse number 14. It's a covenant ordinance. Malachi 2 verse 14. And there it says, Yet ye say, Wherefore, breaking into the whole passage here, but the Lord's dealing with the priests of the days of Malachi, and they hadn't been faithful to their own wives. And Malachi 2.14 addresses this. It says, Yet ye say, Wherefore, because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. Notice that. The wife of thy covenant. And so God uses the term covenant here in relation to marriage. Malachi 2, verse number 14. Marriage, therefore, is a covenant ordinance. And the point made is that marriage as a covenant stresses very, very clearly that it is a lifelong commitment that is made when a couple come together and they marry they enter into a covenant, they cleave to each other, as the Bible says, and therefore they have entered into a lifelong covenant that must not be broken. That's the teaching of this book. That means that the seventh commandment preserves, it guards, it protects the married state from everything that would be detrimental to it and ruinous to it, ruinous to that union in which God makes provision for the physical and emotional needs of both the husband and the wife. And therefore spouses must enter marriage and pursue it as a covenant ordinance that is characterized by commitment to each other. The husband is to be committed to the wife. Husbands, love your wives. That's commitment. And the same, of course, with the wife. Uh, just as he is to love the wife as the Lord loved the church, so the wife is to com be committed to her husband. Titus 2 verse 4, young women are told to love their husbands. And so the idea there is of this covenant ordinance that brings about this matter of commitment to one another. Now, it's on that basis of this personal commitment the flows out of marriage being a covenant ordinance, that provision is made for physical intimacy. The Word of God does not condemn physical intimacy. Rather, it shows that it is the gift of God. But the Word of God makes it very clear that the only realm within which it is legitimate, that is physical intimacy, is within the ordinance of marriage. We should not be afraid of this. We should not try to skirt around it. We should see this is what God says. It is a gift of God, as I say, and it is for the marriage union only. Proverbs 5, verse 18. The Lord says concerning the husband-wife relationship, Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let her be as the loving hind and pleasant roe. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times, and be thy ravished always with her love. Now, 
those words are exceedingly clear. We don't need even to comment on them. God makes it very clear that the only relationship where such intimacy is provided is the male-female relationship in the marriage union. And therefore, the marriage of man and woman is the only legitimate r relationship in the sight of God. Every other form of physical intimacy is outlawed and should be seen as utterly sinful in the sight of God. That all flows out of marriage being not only a creation ordinance, but a covenant ordinance. And the idea in the covenant ordinance is this matter of commitment, and therefore this provision for physical intimacy only within that ordinance of marriage, never outside of it. And the marriage, may I stress, of a man and a woman. Marriage is therefore what you call a conjugal ordinance. And the word conjugal is not very common perhaps, but it is a proper English word and it simply means one yoke. The conjugal relationship, the marriage relationship, it's the same thing, but it's stressing the idea uh, again of one yoke. It stresses the basic concept of marriage that we've already noted, that is the concept of union. It signifies especially the issue of the union of the two as one flesh. Now there's a mystery there that we cannot fathom, I firmly believe, if I'm convinced. Because who can explain those words? They twain shall be one flesh. There's a mystery there, but the point is there is reality there. And the Lord is dealing with this aspect of them being one yoke or united in the sense of becoming one flesh. So husbands and wives are always to think of themselves as being in this conjugal state, legally, Morally, yes, that's true, but physically, emotionally, they are one flesh. They are always to see themselves as being incomplete without each other. Turn to 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11, look at verses 11 and 12. Paul says, Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, Neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman. But all things of God. These are uh, vital verses. They are actually again taking us back to creation. It's actually found the passage here where we're looking at the moment is that passage that deals with the head covering. And, and the Lord's addressing that issue through the Apostle Paul. And he takes us back to creation, and he brings in, as a supporting argument, he brings in the issue of creation. He says in verse 11, look at it again, Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man. Verse 12, For as the woman is of the man, even, what does that mean? The woman is of the man. That's talking about Adam and Eve. The two particular people in view in verse 12 are Adam and Eve, or even Adam taking the order. The woman is of the man. What does that signify? It signifies what you read in Genesis 2. God took a rib from Adam, and with it he made Eve. Now, I know that's mocked and laughed at in our day, but that doesn't change the fact the Bible teaches it and we believe it. That's how woman was made. She was made from the rib of Adam, from that which is taken out of his side. So those, uh, those words are saying this. The woman is of the man. But that goes on to say, even so is the man also by the woman. Which simply means that once God made the first pair and brought them together in marriage, and then the normal procreation process began to take place with the birth of Cain and Abel and Seth and all the rest of the children, what happened then is that a man can't exist without a woman, that is, without a mother. That's what he's talking about at the end of verse 12. So was the man also by the woman. Cain or Abel or Seth could not have had any existence without a woman, that is, without their mother, and of course their father too. But the point is, what Paul is underlining here is that 
men and women basically need each other. And in the realm of marriage, that's where that need is met. And therefore, within the realm of marriage, they can't exist without each other. In the sense of the life that God gives them, however that may last, they are incomplete without, one is incomplete without the other, and we're all aware of, the, of these things. And when, may I put it this way, when there is a happy marriage and a blessed marriage, then each member of that marriage, the husband or the wife, really understands this. And you know, folks, as time goes on and you get older, it becomes actually more blessed and more real and more precious. And that is why there is such sorrow when one passes away. And we're all aware of this. Uh, that, that does come. That comes. The, the, there comes the moment when God says, death comes and one is taken away. And then it's felt even more. And, and so God is laying down here that husbands and wives are to see that they are incomplete without each other. So the seventh commandment protects marriage, the creation ordinance of marriage, and the, uh, the, the, the fact that it is a covenant ordinance. And now we're seeing a conjugal uh, ordinance, in other words, that element and so the seventh commandment in teaching all these things, drawing it all uh, from Scripture, other Scripture, makes it very clear that adultery is the violation of the marriage union. The seventh commandment teaches husbands and wives to recognize that they belong to each other. And furthermore, they are not to be aloof from one another. Turn to 1 Corinthians 7 please. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and look with me at verse 2. Let's get the background here. Verse 7, chapter 1, sorry, chapter 7 of, of 1 Corinthians verse 1. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. So they had written to Paul, this Corinthian church, about certain issues, and this is one of them. This matter of male-female relationships, generally speaking. And so there, had, there was a question about uh, contact. That's really what's the, the, the idea here. Contact between male and female outside of marriage. That's what he's addressing here. So he says, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now that uh, doesn't mean that I couldn't shake hands with a lady or something like that. Obviously, it's, we're not going to be silly about it. It's talking about something else altogether. Something that Paul then goes on to address in verse 2. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication. Let every man of his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Now, he's saying that as a general statement because he does understand the Apostle Paul. He comes to this farther down the chapter. There are instances when it's not the will of God for someone to marry. And people can go through life single and be very content and very happy in their single state. Later on in this chapter, that's addressed. Paul himself was a single man. Some will argue that he had been married in an earlier life and his wife had died. I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us that. But the, the Bible certainly makes it clear that when you take Paul's life and ministry as it appears in the New Testament, he was not a married man. He was a single man. For he actually says down this chapter concerning uh, serving God, he says, I would you were all like me. In other words, I'm very free to serve the Lord uh, in the sense I'm not married. So understand what he's saying there. That was a unique situation because by the same token, Peter was married and other apostles were married. So Paul simply addressing things here in uh, the early part of this chapter with the understanding that, yes, marriage is right, and most people get married, etc., etc. That's the background here. So he says to avoid fornication. And by the way, the word for fornication here is the same word as for adultery. And I will come to this in another study. The one word for, in the, in the New Testament, 
that is translated as fornication, is also translated adultery, is even used with regard to sodomy. The same word. We'll see this in more detail in another study. But anyhow, he says to avoid this, to avoid sins of that kind, that every man of his own wife and that every woman have her own husband. Then he says in verse 3, Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body but the wife. What is he teaching? He is dealing with that area again of physical intimacy. And he is saying that husbands and wives are to recognize that they belong to each other. And they're not to remain aloof from each other. Now, I use the word aloof. Uh, there could be other words used uh, in dealing with what Paul's talking about here. We could use other words, but the word aloof simply refers to a situation where there's a coldness between the two or a distance develops between the two. And Paul says that's very dangerous. It is very dangerous when husbands and wives become so busy that that part of their marriage is not given the attention that God intends it to have. It can be a very dangerous situation. For look at what it says in verse 5, Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. It's often been said <clears throat> that when adultery takes place, with regard to marriage, of course, it's because something has happened in the marriage. Very often, there's that con contributing factor. Something has gone wrong. And aloofness has come in, coldness has come in, and so on and so on. And so, what we've been shown here is, in this kind of sanctified, modest language that the Bible uses, as I said earlier, husbands and wives, spouses, are to live together as they as the marriage ceremony says, in the holy estate of matrimony. And they are to enjoy what God has given them in that realm and rejoice together. And furthermore, they're to let nothing intrude. Remember the basic meaning of this commandment? Thou shalt not commit adultery. It is preserving the marriage union, the marriage ordinance which is a creation, covenant, conjugal ordinance. And it needs to be preserved. Now turn please to Genesis 20. Genesis chapter 20. And look with me at verse number 16. And the background to this, of course, is that occasion when Abraham and Sarah uh, arrived in a certain part of Canaan, and Abraham said to Sarah, You say you're my sister. Why did he do that? Well, Sarah was a very beautiful woman. That's what this chapter shows us. And Abraham, among these pagans, he got scared. He got afraid. And he was scared of them killing him to get his wife. That's how dangerous the situation was. So he said to Sarah, You say you're my sister. Now, she was his half-sister. One of those situations of long ago where the Lord permitted such marriages. But that's the background. And of course, Abimelech, the king of Gerar, he took Sarah, and yet the Lord prevented Sarah, or prevented Abimelech from uh, doing anything with Sarah. That's the background here. Very honestly told the whole story. So, when Abimelech finds out he's not too happy with Abraham, and furthermore, uh, he's quite angry with him for what he had done. So that's the background. But let's go down to verse 16. Here are the words I want you to notice. And unto Sarah he said, Behold, I have given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. Now listen to these words. Behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes unto all that are with thee and with all other. Thus she was reproved. Now what does he mean by that? 
that Abraham was to Sarah a covering of the eyes. Well, what it means is, when the marriage relationship is right and, and is har harmonious and, and functioning properly, marriage is designed to veil both husband and wife. He uses the word covering, it means a veil. So marriage acts as a veil, a covering, to both husband and wife. From what? From the eyes, from the touch, from the words, from the approaches, from the intentions of someone else. That's what it means. Marriage is designed to act as a covering. You know, there's nothing more private than a marriage. By virtue of the, of the very essence of a marriage, or marriage itself, we've seen it today. It's a creation ordinance, it's a covenant ordinance, it's a conjugal ordinance. And into that, into that marriage union, no one else is to enter. As I said, no one is to be allowed to intrude. I use different words there. With the eyes, with the touch, with words, with approaches, with intentions. And that does happen, you see. It happens all the time when... And I even, I'm talking about even Christian circles, because these things happen in Christian circles, where there's a couple married and somebody comes along and he sets his eyes on that husband's wife. Or he maybe touches her. I have to be perfectly honest with you. My wife wouldn't let anybody touch her. But dare help the man if I see him do it. That's the way it ought to be. I'd be exceedingly angry. I'd have the right to deal with that. Words, whatever, approaches. And therefore, those who are married need to take this to heart. This is the teaching of the Bible. Your husband is your veil. Your wife is your veil to protect you. The marriage that God has ordained is designed to protect you and preserve you. And as that works, and that's carried out by both, and it must be carried out by both, then the marriage itself is protected, is preserved from intruders. And let's not forget, there are intruders who want to come in and take what belongs to somebody else. And so, you can see why God has said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. And the basic thing here is, the basic point here is, it is a protection of the marriage union. Let us take what God has given for our protection, and let us thank God for it. And let us use it. And let us pray for our young people that they will see all this, that they'll look to God to give to them the right uh, spouse. We've come to the stage in, in, in life, by the way, where you, you can't even use the word partner anymore. Used to be in days gone by, you'd say the right partner, but now, well, because of how that's all abused, even in government documents, has become meaningless, become a cover-up for all kinds of wickedness. But it used to be, if you taught about your partner, you meant either your husband or your wife. Uh, in the normal sense of the word. But anyhow, I'm just simply showing you how, married, how this commandment is designed to preserve marriage. That's the basic meaning of it. That's the basic, th basic thrust of it. And we'll have to come back and look at it again, obviously, because there's much more here that we need to address as we deal with this seventh commandment. May the Lord take this today and use it and help us all and let us pray for our young people. Let us pray for our marriages. Let us look to God to give 
that preservation that He intends. Father, we pray that Thou wilt abide with us today and continue with us in our study of the Word and in the messages that will follow today. We pray for the power of God, the moving of the Spirit. We pray for Thy mighty presence to be among us and upon us. Come down, we pray. Visit our souls. Give us help and move among us for the glory of Thy name, for the good of souls. We pray this all for Jesus' sake. Amen.